Where do we draw the line in phylogeny? That is the question asked by critics of creation since the phylogeny challenge began. To answer that, we must look at many different components that not only show relation, but also what separates it. If you want to see if a car is similar to another, do you just stand back and look at the lot full of them and say, well, they all have tires and all have similar shapes, therefore that looks related enough for me? Or do you actually open the hood and investigate a little deeper? Obviously, you should not just stand back and look for similarity of something and saying, well, anything with tires was related, or anything living with hands must be related. That's generalizing, but that is exactly what secular evolutionists do internally when trying to prove common ancestry. They look at all the genes and say, look, anything that has more of these similar genes must be related. But that is a foolish way of doing it, because obviously we're going to have more similar genes with an animal that lives on land with similar body structure than we would to aquatic life. Here's an example for you. If we look at overall mtDNA between species, it is far too inconsistent to prove relation. They have discovered that mtDNA sequences between domestic dogs and the gray wolf differ by at most only 0.2%. That is to be compared with the huge 4% difference between some populations of the same gray wolf species. And if we look at the overall nucleotide sequencing, well that doesn't determine relation either. We know this because some things have closer nucleotide sequences that are unrelated. We must dive deeper. Now, the big question, how much modern human variation is there in comparison with the overall animal kingdom? And how is the distribution of human genetic variation similar to or different from the broad swath of animals, especially primates? Well, DNA barcoding is that answer. It allows us to zoom in and address this very question for the very first time in history. When we look at DNA barcoding inside a single gene in mtDNA, we can see a clear genetic boundary in all animal life. Basically, DNA barcoding works through the comparison of nucleotide sequences in the DNA to that of the same gene in other species. This is one way we can differentiate and identify related taxonomically similar families of animal kinds, as the Bible says. As there are clear genetic boundaries, we can see using this technique. You see, animals have two kinds of DNA. One we are the most familiar with is nuclear DNA. It is the genetic blueprint for each individual. But all animals have DNA in their mitochondria, and their mitochondria all contain 37 genes. And one of them is known as the CO1 gene. It is used to do DNA barcoding because it is the best for many reasons. Unlike the genes in nuclear DNA, all animals have the same set of mitochondrial DNA, proving a common basis for comparison. Canadian microbiologist Paul Herbert, who coined the term DNA barcode, figured out a way for us to identify lineage-specific relations by analyzing this gene. Original studies done in 2011 found how well it worked. Dr. Herbert believes that variation within a taxonomic family is restricted by an evolutionary mechanism called selective sweep. Sweeps occur because the CO1 gene functions are so important and constrained that they will always spread through all members of a related family to all future species of that family. The removal of this recorded genetic material of natural variability within animals is the critical feature that creates a distinctive genetic signature for each species tested that makes barcoding possible to test relation. Then, in 2018, they went testing high numbers of species never before done in history, and the results are now in. By analyzing the barcodes across hundreds of thousands of species, researchers found a telltale sign showing that all animals emerged at the same time as well as humans and all have clear genetic boundaries from one another. All felines are the same as well, and showed they were all related all the way down to the species level. The house cat is related to the lion and the panther, and DNA barcoding shows low gap differences. Even though barcoding is mainly used to identify species, it can also work on the family level as well. Now, the same was found in all humans, as when the human lineage was traced from modern day humans to Neanderthal to Denisovan, results showed low barcoding gap differences, and when compared to the primate family, they showed large gaps, meaning humans taxonomically should be in a different family from primates. Gorillas and chimps were vastly different, having large barcoding gaps, meaning they are a different kind. 
The CO1 sequence contains a total of 648 base pairs in almost every group tested. Humans, Neanderthal, and Denisovan were just 1 to 4 base pair sequences different. Very low barcoding differences, proving we are all closely related. Here you can see for yourself the differences between life using DNA barcoding. Just look how similar butterfly species are to one another, yet how different they are compared to an owl. With CO1 sequencing, we can also see the difference between birds and bees, and relation can be mapped out easily. So DNA barcoding compares either or both nucleotide sequences and base pair size to determine relation. Just look for yourself at humans compared to a gorilla. As you can tell, nothing alike. Yet, when humans are placed next to Neanderthal and Denisovan, you can easily see the match. Yet, look at the bottom, I added the gorilla. Look how completely different it is. Now one more time, I want to cover selective sweep. Because the CO1 gene functions are so important and highly constrained, they'll always spread through all members of a related family and to all future new species in that family. So now, if primates shared a common ancestor with humans, then obviously this pre-human chimp hybrid ancestor would contain the base CO1 gene that would have been passed down to both lineages meaning the CO1 gene would be just as similar in humans as it is in the chimp line because of selective sweep. In 2005, Vincent Savalinian stated that in order for any two organisms to be deemed the same species, they must share 88 to 98 percent of the genetic code that is chosen at the CO1 mitochondria gene fragment. This means that because chimps which have 131 base pair fragments different from us, they are unrelated and a different species. That's a 20% difference between us and them, meaning we only share 80% of the CO1 genetic code with chimpanzees, our supposed closest common ancestor. Just look at this chart. This is what related species look like using a heat map. Now, look at where the chimp falls in comparison to humans. Not even aligned at all. So, do you know why there are so many base pair differences? Because we're not the same species. It's that simple. Humans have never speciated. And there is no way around this new evidence. The germline always passes down the CO1 gene, meaning it's inherited without question. Which is the reason why DNA barcoding works so well. The evidence is clear. A common ancestor to human and chimps does not exist because the CO1 gene between us and primates is not the same. Now, combine DNA barcoding with taxonomically restrictive orphan genes, which show which animals aligned with one another on a family level, then we add those two methods with a comparative statistical tool called heat mapping that catalogs the comparisons of all expressed proteins in a species because it provides visual representations of a group to which each species belongs to. Then you have yourself a trio of ways to prove and draw the line of where ancestry ends. Are there more? Yes, for example, zygote fertilization would be another example, but since it's not practical, we will not add these to the list. In conclusion, the largest genetic study to ever take place looked at hundreds of thousands of different species. They discovered a few things. Genetic diversity is about the same, proving that all life arose at the same time, including humans, and they all have clear genetic boundaries. This was so shocking for the scientists working on the project that they said, this conclusion is very surprising and I fought against it as hard as I could. They go on to say, this study is one of the clearest, most data rich and general facts in all of evolution. That the existent population, no matter what its current size or similarity to the fossils of any age, has expounded from mitochondrial uniformity. If individuals are stars, then species are galaxies. They are compact clusters in the vastness of empty sequence space. The absence of in-between species is something that also perplexed Darwin. Now, be honest with yourself. What could possibly reduce all life on Earth to restart, even in lakes, rivers, and oceans? Only the biblical Noah's flood could do this. This was so shocking to the scientist on the study that even the logic behind these findings could not make sense to them. He stated, All species show the same lack 
of barcode diversity. Although it is easy to imagine that humans passed through a bottleneck 170,000 years ago, it's hard to believe that the exact same thing happened in all species. Did herrings really pass through an equally recent bottleneck? Anchovies too? So this not only answers the phylogeny challenge, but it proves the biblical global flood as well. Orphan genes. The working assumption had been that, given common descent, and the fact that most housekeeping genes are shared among living things is highly conserved, including the prior assumption that evolution occurs by extremely small changes. Orphan genes should be rare, if not non-existent. However, as scientists sequenced more genes from different organisms, they are discovering that roughly 10-40% to 40 of each genome's protein coding sequence is new, that is, unlike any other known protein coding sequence. These are orphan genes. And this was one of the biggest surprises to come out of the whole genome sequencing project. Before I can get into it, remember this quote by noble Laurel Francis Jacob. He explained the accepted view of how evolution constructed new genes. He said, Once life has started in the form of some primitive self-replicating organism, further evolution had to produce through alterations of already existing compounds. As you can see, new genes must arise from pre-existing genes, leaving the signal of ancestry in their closely related sequences, because the probability of an alternative is basically nothing. Zero. That is why the discovery of orphan genes, which now show no homology to other sequences, came as a great surprise. It was assumed that getting new genes was hard, and once a workable solution was found, it would be preserved in the descendants that followed. The bulk of genes would have been invented early in evolution, and thus would be broadly shared. However, orphan genes are without detectable homologies in other lineages. Orphans are a subset of taxonomically restricted genes, which are unique to a specific taxonomic level. To put it another way, orphan genes differ from all other genes in that they are lineage-specific, with no known history of shared duplication and rearrangement outside of their specific species or clade. This is yet another way we are able to identify what a created kind is. The more genomes that are sequenced, the more the proportion of orphan genes should shrink if common ancestry were true, as more and more orphans should be shown to be present in other genomes, but that is not proven to be the case. The mountain of orphan genes is growing with every new clade tested, not shrinking. Similarly, horizontal gene transfer was not borne out. The sister genes of orphans should have been found as sample size increased, reducing the proportion of orphan genes. As for gene loss as an explanation, well, it would have been too massive to be realistic to account for the pattern seen. The fact we find orphan genes can only decay but never give rise is also more evidence for our side as well. No testable, observable studies have ever proven that new orphan genes can arise in a species which already had or lost them. The only place this has happened is in the imagination of textbooks. It is also a fact that they are genes without detectable homologies in other lineages. So a fly orphan gene and a human orphan gene are very unique and identifiable. If common descent were true, we should see traces left behind of the orphan protein three-dimensional structure in other species, especially those closest on a taxonomic level, and that is not what we see. Orphan genes are a wonderful for creationists and a nightmare for evolution. Let's pick any Neanderthal from the list. Here's one from the GenBank NC-011137, which was found in Croatia and sequenced in 2009 by mtDNA analysis conducted using the reverse Cambridge reference sequence. This is exactly what you wanted to see and exactly what you're asking for. Here we line up modern day man and Neanderthal, side by side. Here you can see the total mutations being 210 in current man. Neanderthal, only 10. This is exactly what we would expect if creation were true. Ancient man had fewer mutations, modern man has more mutations. My view is that in the beginning, somewhere around 4000 BC, there were no human genetic mutations in Adam or Eve nor their children. Only after the fall was there a sudden activation of genetic mutations, which one or some activated mortality. These mutations would affect the entire genome, but more certainly in the mitochondrial genome due to the close connection between mitochondria and lifespan. Now that we know genetics a lot better, 
we know that genes such as the sirtuins, the LOS1, the APOE, the F4, FOXO genes, all are directly linked to longevity. Especially the MTHFR gene, which controls and regulates how the body functions, regulates genes, and methylates. And if it breaks, then other genes don't function as well, and everybody on Earth has a mutation of this gene from anywhere 20 to 70% loss of function. This genetic superiority of first man allowed extreme longevity. Something about the environment played a huge factor. After the flood, deleterious mutations rose much faster than before. The Bible and many other religious texts around the world are clear pre-flood man lived about 900 years, some of them. In order for this to be true, pre-flood man's physiology had to be superior than ours. Neanderthal had better bone structure, and their bones were thicker and stronger than ours. They had better muscle tone. Neanderthal have up to 50% more asymmetry, better occlusion, stronger teeth, and larger brain cavity. This makes a valid argument saying that Neanderthals were smarter than us because it's been linked that brain size and intelligence are correlated. We have now found evidence that Neanderthal DNA is 99.5% identical with present day humans, and that Neanderthal DNA appears to fall inside the variation of present day humans. Neanderthal had less hair on their backs than present day humans do in theirs. This is due to a genetic marker RS4849721. This marker is shared by Neanderthal and present day humans. For example, if you have a T at this marker position, you probably have less hair than average. Neanderthals have the T, which means they too probably had far less back hair than the average present day human. Hmm, so that's much less hairy of an ape man, don't you think? I'll give you some more evidence. Let's look at 16 different Neanderthal DNA sequences we have and combine them all. An analysis done revealed that the 16 combined Neanderthal genomes have a total of only 18 deleterious mutations in the D-loop. A creationist would expect that these 18 mutations would be passed through Noah's three daughter-in-law, the L, M, and N haplogroups, and would be widely distributed in the modern day population if creationism were true because we believe they are not weeded out through selection like evolution tells us. Guess what? We find all of them but one, 16369A, who probably died in the flood and never passed it on. Do you see the problem now? Natural selection cannot erase accumulating mutations fast enough for evolution to be possible. Evolution everywhere we look is headed in the wrong direction, down. And now we know for a fact that regulatory and repetitive DNA sequences accumulate mutations at a rate of 64 to 175, depending on the study. Most people today do not realize that their science indoctrination comes by the way of the news. The single best mass indoctrination tool in existence. Did you know that your National Geographic is owned by 21st Century Fox? an American conservative cable television news channel. And you really expect honesty and for them to give you accurate, unbiased scientific information? Let's talk for a minute about what the religion of evolutionism indoctrinates people to believe. We all know the basics, that it teaches everyone is related to squirrels, chipmunks, peaches, and pond scum. But it goes much deeper than that. Besides the famous tree of lies that is being uprooted as we speak, they also teach that after bacteria eventually evolved into fish, that later evolved into monkeys, that these monkeys next surfed from Africa to America. That's right everyone, that is how monkeys got to South America they surfed there. But it gets much more ridiculous than that. But why do squid and octopus exist in the theory of evotardism? Well, because according to them, they lack any known phylogeny with anything on Earth. Well, in their words, one plausible explanation, in our view, is that the new genes are likely new extraterrestrial imports to Earth. Grrr. Plausible, huh? Oh, but it gets better. 
They have details for how this fable even happened. They state, the squid eggs hitched a ride to Earth on the back of asteroids. Here is what the team of 33 different authors in a recent peer-reviewed study agreed to say. Thus, the possibility of crypto-preserved squid and octopus eggs arrived in icy bodies several hundred million years ago should not be discounted, as that would be a parsimonious cosmic explanation for the octopus' sudden emergence in Earth 270 million years ago. So cosmic flying squid and octopus flew here from distant parts of the universe just to splash down in our oceans and become mortal enemies with one another. That makes total sense now. And that's totally scientific and logical. <laughs> Atheists are great at word salad and twisting the definition of words around. Macro evolution is the perfect example because they know it has two definitions. So when a creationist says that macroevolution is not true, they immediately jump on the opportunity and use the other definition of the word, which is speciation, which is true, all while ignoring the other definition entirely, which is large-scale change over time, like a dog to a whale, which is not true. They do this knowing darn well that they are being deceitful, so the next time an atheist tries to play word games, Remind them of the actual definition of the word, and how they mix truth with lies to push their agenda, and then expose them for what they are. It's obvious by now that humans need another near-extinction level event to occur, so that we can evolve up again, wouldn't you agree? To our next level. Just like last time, where primitive man went in and modern day man came out. Remember, anything is possible with evolution, even a horse with wings. Just give it time. Give it time. In closing, the next time some cocky atheist god-hater tells you that you believe in magic, remind them, M in M theory, even according to Edward Witten, who is its creator, M should stand for magic, and the true meaning of the title should be decided when a more fundamental formulation of the theory is known. It is them that actually believe in magic, because God hates magic, and even a layman of scripture knows this. So again, it is them that believe in magic, and they are too dumb to even connect the dots, because they don't even know what their own theory teaches. <laughs>